Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Word of Grace. My name is Greg Messier. On behalf of our pastors, Pastor Chet and Pastor Steve, I want to welcome you this morning. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us praising God. I have a couple wonderful things that is going on at the church that I wanted to keep you guys in the know about. The first is that we, this is an exciting development. We are now offering online giving. If you prefer to give online, you can do so at the Church Center app. So I'm not going to stand up here and give a class about how to do that. But if you do, I just registered myself and it was simple to register on the Church Center app and to get to a place where you can do online giving if that's your preference. If you watch us online, you know, welcome. We're, we're so happy that you joined us online this morning. This is also a great way for you to get connected with your local church. So if you have any questions about how to register for the Church Center app or download it or anything, you can always see me or somebody else that's in the know. Um, but that's an exciting way to be able to give. I know some people prefer to give online. So we encourage you to do that. Also, um, our tithes and offerings bucket, we don't pass the basket anymore, but it is back there by the exit door on your right. We just ask, as always, um, please give your offering promptly so that our, our ushers can um, do what they need to do at the end of service. We would appreciate that very much. Also, I wanted to um, let you guys know that we're having a church work day on November 6th. That's a Saturday. And Jerry reminded me that that is the day before we change our clocks for daylight savings. So I also want to have that in you guys' mind because you don't want to be the person that shows up an hour early, right? Um, but Saturday, November 6th uh, is a church work day. We schedule this every year so that we can clean up the leaves and the parking lot around the church grounds and get our church ready for winter. Praise God. Okay, so if you guys are able to come on out, it's a great time. You know, you might even be able to use the big, like, industrial strength leaf blower that we have, which is, which is what I got to do last year. Super fun. So I wanted to encourage you guys there. Otherwise, uh, we have lots of things going on in the church. You can see we have something going on most days here. So please look at your bulletin and get in the know about all the wonderful things that are going on here at Word of Grace. You know, my... Uh, one of my old mentors used to say, whenever the church doors are open, you should be here. And I think that's a good, a good way to look at life. So I wanted to share with you guys this morning, really briefly, out of uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 1. But if you guys want to turn there, 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 1. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And I'm a story guy. I like to read the stories and figure out how I can apply these stories in my life. So 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell all the oil and pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest. Amen. So I love this story because it can mean so many things in your life. I mean, like, like so many things that we find in the word of God, it can mean different things to you in different seasons of your life. So these passages have meant many things to me in the past. And I, 
that's what I love to get up here and share is the things that have made a difference in my life. Because I believe that if it was able to make a difference in my life, it could make a difference in anyone's life. So I wanted to highlight a few things in these passages that I think are important. You know, when I was uh, contemplating this and, and, and looking at it, I mean, you can look at that jar of oil, right? So here you can picture this family very down on their luck, right? This widow had just had her husband pass away. The creditors are coming to get their sons, his sons and, or her sons and sell them into slavery. There's like lots of drama going on in this family, right? And the, and the old widow goes to Elisha, you know, one of my heroes, right? The prophet of God goes to Elisha and says, I need help, Elisha. You know, my husband served you, but now he's gone. And he left me with all these bills, right? Isn't that how men do it? <laughs> but, you know, the one thing that Elisha said is, what do you have? Because Elisha understood that our God is a God of multiplication. Say multiplication. He doesn't add, he multiplies, right? And the heaven that we live under is a heaven of multiplication. Everything God is involved in multiplies. If you are in the will of God, if you are faithful, then God will multiply every area of your life. And here this widow is going to Elisha and saying, Elisha, I need multiplication. And Elisha says, well, I know the person that can do that. And Elisha says, what do you have that God can multiply? And she says, I but have this little jar of oil. Now you think about, you know, I started to think about what is the significance of the jar of oil, right? Because, you know, nowadays we have the, you know, we in our house, we have the little, you know, thing of olive oil that we cook with next to the stove. But back then, in those days, oil was how they lit their home, right? If you didn't have oil, you were in the dark. I mean, it, they didn't have General Electric, right? So she said, all I have left is what keeps us out of the dark, right? This is all I have left. And if, and then she didn't have any food to cook with, but she had the oil to cook, but she couldn't, she couldn't cook. She, had, she didn't have anything left. And, you know, sometimes, guys, we look at uh, problems in our lives and we look for a natural solution to a natural problem, right? She's trying to find a natural solution. You know, maybe somebody can give me a bunch of money or somebody can do this and find this natural solution, this natural problem. She has creditors that are looking for her money. But Elisha, of course, the prophet of God, understands that we serve a supernatural God. And Elisha is like, find me something that God can multiply supernaturally in your life. So the jar of oil comes forth, right? Now, it's interesting in many places in the Bible that I've found is that oil is also a type of faith or a type of the Holy Spirit or both. Right. So you see it in different places throughout the Bible. You know, I was reminded of the story of the 10 virgins. Right. You guys know that one, the 10 virgins. So there were 10 virgins. Each one was supposed to keep their lamp filled with oil and be ready for the bridegroom. Right. Five of the virgins went out with only the oil that they had in their lamp and five went out with an extra vessel of oil so that they would be certain to be ready whenever the bridegroom showed up, right? And this is a parable that Jesus used to show us that we have to keep our faith stoked up. We have to keep our vessel of oil stoked up and ready for when the bridegroom, Jesus, comes back. So we know that the vessel of oil, this jar of oil, the significance of it is likely a way to you or a metaphor to highlight to us that this woman had a little bit of faith. She had just a little bit of faith. And that's all God needed to rescue her from the situation that she was in just a little jar of faith. So today I wanted to encourage and remind you guys that you might be thinking, you might be going through some stuff. You might be thinking, Wow, this is a difficult season of my life. I have these struggles. 
guess what? If you have just a little jar of faith, God can multiply that beyond your wildest dreams. So you can imagine, guys. I, I mean, I can imagine if I walked around Westfield and I started to ask all my neighbors for jars, right? As big a jar as you can give me. I need as many jars as you have, right? That's what it would look like because these people were desperate. They're going to all their neighbors. Give me, a, can I have a jar? Can I have a jar? You have any empty jars? I need jars, right? You can imagine that that would start to stir up some questions with your neighbors, right? I mean, it certainly would with mine. They'd be like, want, they'd be like coming over the house like, what is going on? You know, because we're piling all the jars up in the driveway. So I can imagine that this started to stir up a little controversy in the town, right? And people want to know what the heck was going on at the neighbor's house. But Elisha, in these verses of scripture, and this is the, one of the points that I wanted to make to you, said, close the door. When you find the vessels closed, come in and close the door. Because sometimes if you need a miracle, sometimes if you need a victory in your life, you have to keep the unbelievers out of your miracle. Because they will cast their doubts on you. They'll sow seeds in your mind about, well, God can't fix this problem. You need to be sure that you're sure that God will supply your needs according to his riches and glory. And he will, right? It wasn't Elisha. It wasn't Elisha that caused this miracle to happen. It was the woman's jar of faith that enabled this miracle to happen in her life. So I wanted to encourage all of us today because, you know, we go through different things in our lives or we might be believing for a miracle for somebody else even. But this simple principle that we find in this story in 2 Kings will help all of us to understand that as long as we have a little faith, it may be, it, well, it is the most precious thing that we could have. You can imagine this woman understanding that that little jar of oil, although she thought it was insignificant, turned out to be the most significant thing that she had. So when we look at the problem and we look at the promise of God, I want to encourage us today that don't ignore the supernatural in your life. Don't ignore the supernatural. You could look for all kinds of natural solutions to problems and do that. A prudent person do, does that. But do not take the power of God out of your life. Because the same thing that happened to this widow can happen in the lives of each and every one of us. Amen? Amen? So I just wanted to encourage you guys today. I think I could preach on this particular verses of scripture for days. I mean, there's so much here. But this is the principle that I wanted to help us all to understand. Because this is something I'm applying in my life. And I wanted to bless all of you guys with it. Amen? So, <laughs> amen. Praise God. Praise God. So I just wanted to pray with you guys before I turn it over to Pastor Chet, because I really have it on my heart that, you know, we do have people here that are going through some things, and we do have people here that are trying to figure out if they have enough oil. Amen? So, Heavenly Father, we just come before you today, Lord, and we just humble ourselves and we ask you, Lord, that today, as we might be looking at different challenges or different problems or different situations in our lives, Lord, that, that you just help us to understand, Lord, that that jar of oil, that little faith that we have, Father, that faith the size of a mustard seed, as Jesus said, right, can make marvelous things happen in our lives, Lord. Let us not forget today that the most valuable thing we possess is our faith in your son, Jesus. Lord God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to you except through him, Father. And our faith in him, Father, enables us, Lord, to live as victors in this life, Lord, to live as conquerors, Lord. Let us not have a victim mentality today. Let us not feel down on ourselves, Lord, but let us be the sons and daughters of the most high God today, Lord. And let us understand, Father, that you are with us and you will never leave us nor forsake us, Father. 
And Lord God, as we pray today, Father, and we ask you, Lord, to just have mercy on us as uh, your sons and your daughters today, Father, and to help us, Lord, in these many situations that may be going on, Father, whether it might be financial or maybe we're having struggles in relationships, Lord, or, or we might, there might be physical ailments, Father. I, I don't know what it is, Lord, but I know you do. Father, today, Lord, as we put those things in your hands, Lord, we believe and declare, Lord, that that small vessel of oil that we have is just enough for you to use to turn the situation around, Lord, and that we would live in your abundance, Father. And we just thank you and praise you today for everything you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Wow. That was... Uh... A great tie into our conclusion on faith today as we're in the shield of faith. You want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6? We've had a lot of messages on faith because the scriptures, and I believe the Holy Spirit, point out that it is the above all issue in my life. Uh, vision. I love the song, Be Thou My Vision, my favorite song of this decade has been that. Uh, we go to decades in life, by the way. Do you know you live your life in decades? You know? Uh, hopefully you look back and you see how stupid you were and you, you've done better. Hopefully you haven't got more stupid. It's a tough world we live in. We have a God of this world that wants to destroy us. But we have a God of all mercy and grace that really, really leads us forward. So we want to be people that walk in the light. You got to kick up the light a little bit in your life, don't you? I mean, when you're, I was thinking when you were saying like her faith was like an ember. Uh, Paul talks to Timothy and says, stir up the gift. It means stir up the ember so you could see something. In other words, when you have a fire, it does a lot of things. In the ancient world, that's all they had was fire. They didn't have electric lights. They had candles. They had oil. They had wood fires or some kind of fuel for fire that gave light they could see in the night. Uh, he encouraged Timothy to stir it up. In other words, a lot of times your embers go down. When you lose your faith, you lose your first love, by the way. The two go hand in hand. Because when we talk about faith, one of our definitions is the idea that Faith really is the idea based on faithfulness, which is really the idea based on honor. And the idea of based on having respect for God. Again, we don't love what we don't respect. We inspect it and we don't really love it or we don't really like it because guess what? Liking is part of love. I, I can be committed to somebody, a wayward child or somebody, a brother in the faith, but I may not like what they're doing because guess what? God doesn't like what we're doing when we live contrary to what he wants us to do. He wants us to walk in the light. He wants us to be children of the light. He wants it to be inside of us before it comes out of us. He wants us to have those earthen vessels, just like Gideon that came down the mountain. They had that in an earthen vessel again, and they had light, and oil and light are synonymous with the Holy Spirit. He gave them tongues of fire. But somewhere along the light, in the middle of the crisis, he wants us to be broken and break those lights and let them shine just like the virgins, and shine, and guess what? My enemies will be dismayed, won't they? In fact, 300 Israelites run down. They had thousands. They're reduced to 300. 300 run down. Assault. The craziest thing in the world you can possibly imagine. You know, I'd love to see myself in one in that position, like and hear God say, you know, to Gideon, we're, we're going to attack this gigantic force. Such military genius, right? Greg's a military guy. This is our plan. We're going to run down this hill as fast as we can. We're going to have these candles in these earthen vessels you can't see. And then halfway down the slope, we're just going to scream and shout. And then we're going to break the lights and shine them. And that's the battle. <laughs> and our enemies will be destroyed. They'll kill each other. Isn't it crazy? Fight crazy with crazy, right? It's kind of like what faith does. It's kind of like the battle we walk and we fight. It's like the battle is the Lord. We're really not enemies. You know, you, you read in Ephesians chapter 6. I want to read it because I haven't read it in a while. This is our main text for spiritual warfare. Uh, 
It says in verse 10 of chapter 6, remember preceding chapter 6 is all what God gives you. He makes you a son. He talks about salvation, that it's by grace and faith is a gift. Remember, faith is a gift. When I see him, I believe him. And, you know, I trust him. That's why Whitfield said the first part of faith is you must be born again. He kept saying you must be born again. The greatest one of the greatest preachers in the history of this country, English, he walked around saying one thing, preaching one thing. You must be born again. People said, why do you do that? Because you must be born again. That's what Scripture says. You must. And it goes on to say in that same verse, it says, you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Now, faith is what? Seeing, isn't it? I mean, I can't be a great soldier if I'm deaf, blind, and mute, can I? I have nothing to say. I can't see and I can't hear. I really, uh, I think I'd get that little sticker when you go up to the, you know, the military counter to volunteer and they look at you and you're ready to go and here I am. And they look at you, okay, what's your name? Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, it says here you, you can't see. And you're blind, and uh, you can't hear, but you're here. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know what? Uh, you, you're dumb. You can't speak because you never heard, never saw. Uh, you're Helen Keller before Helen Keller was Helen Keller. Uh, I don't think you can fight, but sir, I got one word for you. You must be born again. <laughs> you must be born again. You have to see Jesus. He's the gaze, isn't he? So in the warfare, and remember, these are metaphors. We're not soldiers. This isn't a rouse like Byron somewhere in the back, anywhere. This isn't a rouse to, to go to the gun club, you know. We're not militiaing up here. We're like warriors of love. Now, we're men, but we're warriors of love, okay? We're not flaky. We're warriors of love. Faith and love go together. They both work together. So... He says here, he says, finally, in these metaphors, brother, be strong, and the soldier has to be healthy before he can go in. Lord, in, and in the power of whose might? His might, right? That means you may not be strong right now, but you could be strong in his might. You could be strong, like Paul would say to Timothy, in 2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 2, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus, right? Endure hardship as a good soldier. Be strong in the grace of God. Teach that to other people. Discipleship. Let it come in you and let it go out of you. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The whole armor. He uses this as a metaphor. He defines that metaphor. He wants you to stand. He wants you to resist the devil. Do you know nowhere in the Bible does it say we attack the devil? Do you know that? There's so many crazy things out there like we're going to exercise the devil. Believers don't have, can't be possessed. If you ever think about those possession crazy scary movies, it's Halloween coming close, so they're out there on the TV. If you're a believer, you cannot be possessed by hell because God possesses you. Right? You can be influenced. You can watch that and feed on it. You can get obsessed by it. But you can't be touched by it because the evil one touches you not. In First John 5, 19. Why do I know that? Because I don't like the evil one touching me. Get your hand off me. Right? I'm standing. We're called to resist the devil and he will what? Flee from us, right? He wants us to flee from him. Because you're easy mark when you run backward because you got no armor on your back. You can't stand to stand against a mature son of God. That's why we mature. So listen, we don't fight this carnal fight. We don't war against flesh and blood. We love our enemies. This is the great, like if you want to be a real strong soldier, Paul was like, writing this is like, the Green Beret, or the Navy SEALs, because he got shipwrecked on the ocean and he fought on the land. He was both. He was like a special force major, that he could stand for Christ. In other words, he could exalt a Savior within him and with outside him. 
within, like we said in Philippians. He works in, but he wants to come out, doesn't he? He wants to do his work within me, make me strong and healthy, but he wants to be exalted in me and come out of me to those around me because they need him too. But he can't do that first until my what? My pot overflows, right? It's hard to do that and help your neighbors with an empty pot, isn't it? The pot has to fill up. I have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they are the verses before this. Satan really wars against those who are filled with the Spirit. And the other ones, he what? He destroys. They follow him no more. I got lists, I got a church full of Christians that I could probably name if I take the time that could fill it that follow him no more. Because they've been what? They've been destroyed. They've given in. They've surrendered. If you don't think you're in a battle for your faith, you know, MacArthur, John MacArthur was saying today, if you don't think that you're in spiritual warfare, guess what? You're dead already. Satan wants to destroy you. He hates everyone. He wants to destroy your family. He wants your kids not to go to college, but to end and join the Between the Bridges ministry. Not as a minister, but as a client. He wants your kids to OD. He wants death. And he wants destruction in his father of it. And the people he hates the most, he hates all people, but the ones he hates the most, are the ones that are born again. He has two purposes, really. One, to stop people from being born again, and one, to thwart the growth of people that are. Doesn't he? That's the battle. Satan doesn't want you to grow. You don't want to grow. That's from Satan. Satan, God wants you to be strong. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be powerful. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But we press against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness that motivate all this behind it all of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. Their process is what? Confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. God gives you a sound mind and does things decently in order in your life. Two complete opposites. Therefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, again, withstand, because he's going to attack you. If you're a believer, he's going to attack you. He's already got the world in his power. The evil day, and, and having done all again to stand. Stand again. Therefore, having girded your waist in truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, these are metaphors, but really, let's take the metaphors out. Stand there for having girded with truth. The truth will set you free, won't it? I gotta see the truth, don't I? Before I know it, I gotta hear it. We talked about the two places of what? The beginning of faith is a gift. First of all, it's being born again. You see the kingdom. Second of all, it's what? The growing and beginning of faith is what? Faith comes by hearing in Romans ten seventeen and hearing the word of God takes care of my blindness, and that takes care of my deaf ears. I hear it. It's given at salvation as a gift, and I now can see and hear God. This is the beginning of a relationship, isn't it? Everybody I know, I bet, and everybody I know more, I hear more, don't I? I listen to. I call them on the phone. I talk to them. You know, there's people I know a long time. There's people I know a little bit of time. There's people I call because I want to have a relationship. When they respond to that, you know, or call me back, I say, this is the most amazing thing. Maybe they even want to have a relationship with me. Isn't that amazing? Who am I that I'd have a relationship with somebody? That's God. God looks to have a relationship with you. And this is a relationship of love with him. And Satan wants to stop that. He wants to tell you God doesn't love you. Doesn't know what Satan has always done? What did he do with Adam and Eve? He said what? God doesn't really love you. God's withholding things from you. 
God's thwarting your growth. You know, if you ate that tree, he tells you not to. He's such a legalist, by the way. If you ate that tree, I know, wait, look at it. It's beautiful. Look at the tree. It's gorgeous. I mean, it, it is like a shopping mall window at Christmas, right? It's beautiful. That fruit is there for the eyes. Man, I bet you if you touch it, it feels really good. And I bet you if you ate it, man, it would give you the power to be like God. But God's not going to give it to you. But you know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you, go eat it. Go eat it. You'll be like God. What a salesman, right? What a salesman. And the woman did it. And the woman spoke with an authority. Like the word brand spoke devotional today was on the woman. He, she spoke it in the Hebrew. She spoke with an authoritative, usurping voice of command. And her husband yielded to it. And he ate with her. He was as guilty as her. He should have stood up to her. He didn't stand. When he knew it was wrong, he didn't stand. He folded like a deck of cards. And sin entered into the world. And Adam was really to blame. Because he should have been a covering for Eve. And loved her. Being that by nature, coming out of him, he was the, she was the weaker member. Right? And God told him not to touch it first. Right? So he didn't stand. And we all fell. Satan is always about destroying. And bring, he did the same thing to Christ, didn't he? How'd he come at him? If you be the son of God, questions, right? You know, he comes at you the same way. Even because you're so spiritual, he comes in the world. God wants you to be happy. That's what blessing is. And you know if you sin, you'll be happy. And you know... You have great theologians teach you that God's unconditional. That you don't have to do anything. You just be a big, fat, happy baby and make messes everywhere. And God is so happy about that because everybody knows babies are so cute. They are cute. And they go through decades of change. And you know what? I'm very happy the day they get, that I don't have to change them anymore. Or make believe I changed them. And said they must have just went. Two hours later. Eh? No, I wouldn't do that. Never did that. Men don't do that. We stand. We stand. And we have what? We have truth. We have righteousness. Therefore, you know what? God has declared me righteous. And you know what? I want to do right things because I am righteous. When I'm a sinner. I sin because I'm a sinner. When I get saved, I'm justified. So I'm right. So I want to do things right. And I have my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And this means that, you know what? The real peace that matters is your mental peace. The real peace that matters is the Colossians and Ephesians peace of chapter 2, that God has made peace through the blood of his cross with the Father. I may not feel a peace, but if I'm saved today, I have peace with God because of the blood of Christ. That's the real peace that matters. That's the predominant peace, that I'm at peace with God because God died to give it to me. And then God wants me to have the peace that passes understanding. That's imparted to me. i got to fight for that. Do you realize every inch of spiritual warfare, every ground, okay, every inch of ground in D-Day and the evasion to get to Berlin was fought for? You know, when they came through Italy, they fought inch by inch up the peninsula all the way to Rome. They had to fight for every inch of ground. Men died every inch of ground. Do you realize if you want spiritual maturity, you've got to fight for it? Do you realize that the, the stakes are not just yourself, but everybody around you you love? That you stand? That you're mature? That you're committed? That you can draw people. Why? Because Christ is lifted up in you. If he be lifted up in your life, then he'll draw people to you. Because your life will be charismatic. So he wants us to what? He wants us to fight this fight. And he wants us to have all these things. He wants us to have be free. He wants us to be right. That we have what? A testimony. Because people have to respect us to listen to us, don't they? We're not perfect. But we should have respect. We should say what we do and do what we say, right? We should be faithful because he's faithful. That means we're full of faith. We're trustworthy. We don't lie willfully. 
We're all liars, but I don't have to lie. I can tell to speak the truth in what? Love. And love makes me speak the truth. We shod with this peace. Above all, we take, and this is where we are, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Faith is above all. So are the others included in this. But without faith, where's my helmet if I can't see it? Where'd I put my sword? I do good enough with two eyes wondering where I put things. That's why I have a wife. Honey, where'd I put that? How many of you women are just tortured by that by your husband? It's like, you know, just... How the heck do I am I omnipresent for you? But well, honey, you should know where I put it. You should know. You back up like brain. Before Google was, Diane is, right? There you go. Where is it? <laughs> Kids are even worse, right? My mother used to say, you know what? You might say, Mom, where'd you put that? Mom died. Mom's dead. She doesn't know. That was her line. Because it became an everyday thing. I got to be able to see it. I got to know where it is. I got to learn how to get it and put it on. I got to grow in that. I got to have better eyesight, don't I? And faith is. Faith, the shield of faith. And it talks here about the fight that you're going to get shot at. Where's God? Where's he going to attack you? Your faith. Isn't he? And this is the connection we're going to talk about today in the trials of faith. There's a connection between faith and love and humility and grace. And I want to really put that to you today. I want you to know that today. I want you to assimilate it in your brain and never forget it. I want you to use it in your walk, that you understand the mechanics of it. i got to know it before I can do it, don't I? We live in an age of thinking. You know, I, you ask people what they believe. Well, I think. Well, I don't care what you think as much as what God thinks, that there is a God. Your opinion is one of, one of 8 billion opinions. In the middle of all that 8 billion, there's one person that has a true opinion, that's God. What's his opinion? I'd like to know it. Pastor Steve said something um, to be uh, the men's sufferology group. I want to put a thing out, sufferology, we're, we're teaching it. I'm going to open this week up. If you're if you're a woman, you want to come and see what the men do on Wednesday nights. A bunch of old men sitting around. It's very interesting. We're talking about sufferology. We'll open it up for you because you should know sufferology. Because if you don't know it, how do you fight? You should know it. You're scared. You're afraid. You run. Your backside's open. You're killed. You need to know the connections. So Wednesday night is Wednesday. Yeah, if you want to come out, you're welcome to come out. We'll have a, we'll have a meeting. The ladies, you can come out and prepare yourself because the soldier should be what? Prepared. The preparation. The preparation, the preparing this of what? The shotting of the gospel of peace in my life. But you know here because you're going to get what? The shield of faith is going to stop the fiery darts. And therefore, I know fiery darts are coming at me to kill my faith, right? I need to soak it with the water of the word. We talked about that in the series, right? That when those darts hit, they don't ignite and blow me up, but they're put out by the wet shield. I need to see where the enemy is. I need to have all these things in my life, but above all, faith is what really gets you in the battle, the maturing process. I need to take the helmet of salvation. I need to have my head screwed on. I always just think I had the head screwed on, right? Because Satan's going to constantly throw a dart at my faith to say, you're not saved. True? You're no good. Maybe I'm reprobate. Maybe there's no hope for me. If you're here today, there's hope for you. There's hope two ways. If you're not born again, you can get born again. If you're a religious person, if you said a prayer, you've never seen him, you don't know the kingdom of God, you can't see it, this is all gibberish to you, maybe you're not saved. If you are saved and you have like little coals sitting there, but that, that fire, it's like a campfire gone bad, right? Right? I mean, it happens all the time because my wife's, we're, we're fire freaks, but we have fires all the time. So what do I got to do? I'm the maintainer of the holy flame. I have to kick it. I have to throw a piece of wood on it. Right? That's my job. It's in the whole contract. It was in the marriage vows. You will maintain the fire. 
you will build it. <laughs> That's just it. So I have to maintain it. I have to kick it. I have to stir it up. And all of a sudden it ignites and there's a flame again. And it's pretty. And it's warm. And you could see. True? There's many properties of quality to it. But I've got to stir it up so I can see. Without light, you can't see. And so I need to have my head screwed off about my salvation. I need to know, am I saved? You need to know that. I can't tell you you're saved. I know I'm saved. Why? I could give you about five hours of testimony and tell you how I know I'm saved, how I met God in my life. It changed my life. And right now, guess what? I fight to keep that relationship. I have to fight to keep everything in my life, don't I? Maintain it, right? Build it up. Make it joyful. The problem is me. If I'm not joyful, why? I can have joyful in every situation, Paul said. I'm going to make the most, the most of every situation I'm in, and I'm going to rejoice in him. And then I need to what? I need to what? Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, all these are metaphors for a war of what? Faith and love. <laughs> this is about faith. This is about loving the unlovely. This is about loving those that want to cut your head off, right? This is about like, not a battle like, you know, Jesus, uh, Peter cuts the air, uh, air off the, uh, the soldier. You know, when they're taking Christ, Jesus just knocked them down with one word. He just says, you know, who do you seek? And, you know, and they fall backwards, a whole troop fall backward at it. It's just his word. Peter gets emboldened. Let's take him on. He goes to take a guy's head off. He, he twists. He gets his ear. And Jesus puts it back on. Right? Why'd you do that? I just dropped it off. That's not the battle we're fighting here. I'm putting it back on. We're not fighting against this guy. In fact, this guy probably got saved in the process. I think I would get saved if you put my ear back on. <laughs> I think you must be God. He just glued my ear back on, but nothing. <laughs> I can about guarantee you he got saved. Right? Now, I can't put people's literal ear back on, but you know what? I can put people's ear back on that have lost their faith, can I? I can put people's ears back on that don't have any faith. Can I? I can love them like they've never been loved. I can be kind to them. I can be gentle to them. I could have to speak the truth, but I can speak it in what? Love, right? True? Sometimes it may be offensive, but guess what? I have a good bedside manner with the offense, right? There's the war work we're supposed to do. And so turn to James chapter 1. We're going to speak on trials and doubt. You know, I've been talking to people about revival, and always people want revival, and I'm all for revival. As long as it's from God, not strange fire. They want to whoop up. But in me, in me. This whole beginning thing begins in me. James chapter 1 is the last place we're going. It really talks about the battle and the process. It's a process God has used to turn curses into blessing. God has used your free will. He doesn't want to make a law of life. He uses your free will for you to choose life. He uses your free will that you'd want to know him. You'd want to know him more. You'd want to know him more. You'd want to know him more. And then eventually through the process, you become more and more like him. This is faith wars. Doubt is separation. James chapter 1, James is the brother of the Lord, as we said last week. He came to the Lord by what? Meeting him in the resurrection. You know, you could meet him in the resurrection. That's being born again. The providence of God, the reality of answered prayers, the reality of seeking, finding the one who's seeking you way before you sought him. Every believer that gets saved knows one thing. The seeker was sought. That God sought me way before I sought Him. He is there. And He is not silent. 
James speaking to Christians. Not talking about the resurrection, but a wisdom book. Talking about Christian lifestyle. He says, my brethren, these are saved people. Count it all joy. They were coming at them all around this time of the world. And it's coming at us. And this is why you need to know this more and more as these days approaches. When you fall into various trials, temptations, tests, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience, supermeno, abiding under. You always go back to John 15 when you know the Greek word. It means under to abide. Life's going to make it under to abide. See, God uses trials. The whole world is in a trial. You're surrounded by war. I mean, in America, you live in a bubble. I encourage you to get out of the bubble. We're surrounded by starvation in this world. We're surrounded by war. We're surrounded by pestilence. Now it's here. Starvation is real. Not, I think I might miss lunch today and fast. How about I don't have anything to eat all week, neither do my kids. It's all around us in this world, which we're part of. And yet we live in the lay of the sea and in all the blessings we have that not brought us closer to God, but brought us far away from God. You see, we have a Christianity that thinks of this. The stronger faith I have, the stronger faith you have, the less trials you will have. In other words, if I believe in God, and you know, I, I believe, I just say I believe in God, then you know what I should, I should have this positive prosperity life. You're not healed? Well, it's probably because I don't have enough faith, and if I have more faith, I, I'm healthy today. Okay, I'm very healthy today, but it's because I have way more faith than everybody. And the problem with you guys is you just don't have enough faith. Can I tell you something? That's a lie from the pit of hell. I've already prepared myself to get sick. I prepared myself to get martyred. Why? Because I don't know if I will be. I've had a dream of mine all my life, and I don't know if I get weird dreams. You have weird dreams, nightmares? I have weird dreams getting martyred. Because those that stand before the faith, and we're going to be called to stand in a world that doesn't want us to stand, are going to want. They're going to suffer persecution. All that live godly will. If I don't want persecution, then I don't want to live godly. I just want to blend in with the background of hell. And he'll be ashamed of us. But that's okay. He'll get over it. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You guys are all grace guys. In fact, what's the name of the church? What church? I forget something. Word of grace. <laughs> you guys are all grace guys, right? Grace guys are very close. They're very easy to get the antinomous guys, except that there's no law. They don't like the law. They don't like legalism. But we do hate sin. Sin kills people, right? Sin is the malady for everything in your life. Missing the mark. Doing opposite of the will of God in time and space. And it has its consequence. True? And the consequences aren't pretty. To those around us, to us in us. Faith is tested. Faith isn't supposed to be that. It's supposed to be this. <laughs> the more faith you have, the more trials come, and the more you're tested, and the more you go through them. You live in a world right now of judgment. And there's going to be a whole world that's being judged. And guess what? You may be in the world and not of it, but the world, you're still in the world, aren't you? And there's still going to be heartache. And there's still going to be multitudes that don't want God. And I have to be what? I have to be prepared and strengthened to reveal God and to always need Him in my life and let Him be the desire of my life. That's faith because He's faithful. Faith always does what? It looks unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And if it's everything in between, as I look at the hymn, I become more and more assimilating and more and more like him. And I go through tests to prove that to myself, to God, right? Listen, this is the same with Jesus. 
We think God's just going to say well done or be pleased with us because we breathe. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why was he pleased with him? Because he did what he wanted. We like to live in unconditionalville. We like to play the Armenian and the, and the Calvinistic joke, both extremes, and God hates extremes. A false balance in Proverbs 11 and 1 is an abomination to the Lord. Well, I'm a Calvinist over here. I believe that everything that happens is God. And so I'm waiting for him to happen. You'll sit in your chair a long time. You don't stand in your chair. You sit in your chair. Then you get blisters and splinters and bed sores in your chair. You're called to get out of your chair and walk with him. We stand out of a chair. We walk with him through faith. We have to stand when the devil comes. And we're called to stand. We're not Armenius either. It's not all by works. It's a two-way relationship, isn't it? This isn't a one-way relationship. There are unconditional covenants, which mean this. They're not unconditional. They're based on God's word, that God esteems his own word above his name. Psalm 138, 2. They're based on that, and that he made you through his word, and that he made you in his image, and you know what? He feels responsible for you. That's the condition. And it's all based on him that you get saved. He died to get you saved. You can't save yourself. You not you didn't merit it. It's unmerited in a sense, but it's not unconditional. That's the condition. He's faithful. He keeps his word. I respect him. Not only that, he was obedient in Philippians 2, what? To death, even the death of the cross. He was humble. A faith works by love. And humility on my part, these are two different parts here. God's side, your side. The, uh, the conditional covenants of God are all about what? Moses had conditional covenants. The law was a conditional covenant. Did God destroy the law? No. He fulfilled it. Those that, Paul writes in Romans in Hebrews chapter 10, those that died against the law and unbelieving to God were what? They had a severe punishment. How much more you? If you, you neglect all the warnings of God, if you neglect salvation, if you neglect the relationship, how much will you be judged as believers? And there's a judgment for believers. I don't want to believe that. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not as far as it being true. God said there is. And so I, you know what? I'll listen to the one who died for me over I'll listen to you. You know, you got a greater opinion. I'll, I'll come to you and say, hey, did you die for me? How, why, why should I trust your opinion? Did you die for me? Did you even bear me? You're not my mother. You're not my father. He died for me. He made me. He redeemed me. He's got a home waiting for me. I think I'll bet my dollar on that relationship over any other relationship. And the devil's going to try to come to us with other relationships, other opinions. That's why you, you were saying, who do you hang around with? Why do you think it's so important to go to church? Why? Because you hear this here and you should hear it amongst each other. I should be strengthening in your faith. You should be strengthening my faith. Iron sharpens iron. You want to hang around a bunch of unbelievers? Maybe that's why your faith is so weak. And God wants you to grow in faith. I need to abide under him. I need to be humble. And then it says this, and this has to be continued, and this should go for the prayer meetings and everything else. If any man lacks wisdom, yeah. If any man lacks wisdom, yeah. Let him ask of God, who giveth us all liberality and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not this man suppose that he will receive anything from God. How many of us pray in this position? 
Have you ever thought about it? Doubting. Or let's put it this way. Not listening. You know, God prays too. I think we should listen to God's prayers more than our prayers. Do you know God prays for you? He's, he ever. How about this? Do you pray? Do you pray? Isn't that great? You pray. You pray a lot? That's beautiful. God ever liveth. All the time. Never stopping. God ever liveth to make what? Intercession. You think you ought to listen to his prayer for you? Do you think God may pray for you? You want to hear that prayer? I can tell you what it is that you'd have wisdom. Because he is wisdom, by the way. The wisdom of God is different than the wisdom of the world. I, wisdom, in Proverbs chapter 8, speak. Do you know the principal thing in the Old Testament was to get wisdom? He is wisdom. How do you fight this war? How do you grow in faith? How do you get the victor's crown? How do you, how do you, how do you stand? You see? Paul never, very rarely prays for himself. In fact, he tells you that when he prayed for himself, God said no. Isn't that great? You know, I'm praying for myself that my that my that this would be taken care of. I'm praying for myself. Three times I prayed, and then the Lord said, knock it off. My grace is sufficient for you. Do you ever worry about your prayers and, and the world around you and your own wants? When God says, I know, I am wisdom. I know what they need. You're praying what you want but I know what they need. Why don't you pray for what they need? Why don't you listen to me and find out what they need? You're praying all these little things. Maybe you get a good job, maybe you get this. Maybe God wants to have a lousy job. Maybe God wants to work in humility in their life. I don't want humility to work in my life. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who humbled himself. Listen, the spotless lamb of God can humble himself, but you won't. Think how arrogant we are. He humbled himself to death, even the death of the cross. The worst punishment known. How does this work? How does this work? Well, well how it works with grace is this, is that all of us have to understand that faith is what pleases God. Understand what grace is. Throw all the unconditionally unmarried. Let's put this simple. Grace is the favor of someone, the favor of God. Let's go back to what the definition of faith is in, in 1 6. 1 1 talks about the progression of faith, becoming what God is. 1 6 says it's impossible to please God without what? Faith. How do you think you get grace? Favor. You have to have faith. Right? You have to have faith. If you don't have faith, you have doubt. You can only have one or the other. Doubt does what? It doesn't please God. Satan tosses you to and fro. You pray and you get nothing. Because you ask what? Later in this book it says you ask amiss. Then you can consume it on yourself. That's why I love praying by myself. I'm sorry. I mean, I go to prayer meetings and prayer meetings we should go to. We have them. But I like praying by myself. I don't like people seeing me prostrate on the floor. They kind of they ask questions about that. But I, I, I like prostrate myself before God by myself. Yeah. I like that in my own way. I like praying by myself. I like to listen to God. I like to ask God that he would grow us into his image, me. And trials are going to come to prove that in my life, and they have in my life. And you know what? I count them all joy. I didn't, the trials I've gone through, I look back to hindsight in my life. I, don't, I didn't like those trials. I hated those trials. I look back and thank God for those trials. I thank God for them in hindsight. Because they do what the Bible says. They put me under God. They make me humble. 
you know, if you live in this world today, you, why be humble? You have everything. Look, I'm driving this, I'm driving that, I have this, I have that, I have that, I have a $100 bill in my pocket, I, 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 I can go, I, wow, look at me. God really loves me. Does that show you God loves you? Why do the wicked prosper? They just show you're wicked. I need to go through the trials, and I need to become what it says. Not doubting, I need to what? I need to let patience have its work, this abiding under, that I might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Isn't that where Paul got to the place? I've learned to be abound and obeys. I honestly believe I could go to India and live. I can't leave my wife, but if I could go, I could go to India and live, and I could abound. And I could go into a rich person's house and abound. And I can go here and abound. Why? Because I'm a tent carrier. Man, in my past life, I had slept under uh, bridges and, and hiking, hitchhiking around in the old hitchhiking days, and on, under tables. It, it didn't matter. Plus, I have the gift of sleep. I can sleep anywhere. That's why God gives his beloved sleep. But you know what? It didn't matter. I'm on a journey. Nice things, yeah, not compared to God, right? I need to grow, and I need to go, and I need to be going through this thing. Because Satan is about what? He's about killing my communication with God. He's about killing leaders in the church. He's about cutting my supply lines, isn't he? This is what you do in battle. You kill communication. Do you remember Iraq War? They put all the little chips in all the stuff. They, they sold Iraq when they went in. They had chips in there to locate them because they knew where they were, were all the military communication points. What's the first thing they did? They blew them all up. No communication. That's what Satan does. Do you realize you go to church to communicate with God and people because it has to come in and go out? What's he trying to do? He tries to kill leaders. When one leader falls, half the church falls away. Because they're hurt. A big tree falls in the woods. Guess what? It takes a lot of small trees with it. So pray for your leaders. Pray they stand. He tries to cut your supply lines. And then he kills soldiers, right? Or causes people to surrender and give up fight. But the Bible says God is for me who can be against me, right? All things work together for my good. I need to be able to see God, and I need to go forward with God, and I need to be strong in the grace of God. Humility and faith go hand in hand. When I have faith, I'm humble, and I hear God, and I get the grace of God. Many people don't get the grace of God because they don't walk by faith. And faith pleases God, and grace is the favor of God. Do you think God would look at your life and say, well done where you are right now? Would he? I ask myself that question. God, am I on the path of well done? Am I obedient to you? Am I faithful? Well done, good and faithful. Righteous, good, trying to be holy, trying to fight sin, fighting sin. Fighting the devil, loving people, going forward, obedient to God. Not just here. You're really good seat sitters. I will tell you, you guys sit and you see a few of you are a little bit leaning to the left and right. Well done, good and faithful. He didn't say this, did he? Well done, good and faithful seat sitters. Servants. What do you want, God? What's your will? Not a good soldier, I'm a coward. Then build yourself up, be strong. Cast out all fear. Love. How about the love? Faith, love. Love cast out all fear. You can't be a good soldier if you're afraid. Fear comes, but you deal with fear. With courage. He's with me. You have to go forward. And you have to see. And you have to fight. And you have to grow. You only grow by exercising yourself. You know, you can learn all the basic training stuff, but sooner or later you got to go out and fight. you got to go through mock fights, don't you? People shooting, shooting live ammo over you. you got to go into battle situations. you got to be ready. you got to be ready. Are you prepared? Let me tell you, 
sufferology. You better be prepared to suffer. You're going to be hit right with a brick in the face and say, where did that come from? How could God do that for me? You get hit with an illness. Maybe, you know, whatever reason, to test you, to try you, to chasten you. You know, suffering could be chasing from the hand of God. Suffering could be from Satan. There's all different kinds of suffering. You better know which one. The first thing you should do whenever suffering comes your way, is it me? Did any of you do that? Are you a son of God? Do you believe you're a son of God? You're not given that. That's a, that's a potential. As many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Even those that believed is the process, faith. You're not given to be a son of God. You have to want grow in that by faith. You have to grow in being like him. You have to go forward with that. And as many as believed him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. You have to fight for your standing or you won't stand. And when you don't stand, listen, it's not a good thing. Is it? How many of you like being knocked down? I don't like being knocked down. I like to watch the devil be knocked down. Right? I like to watch him. How many of you like fleeing? I don't like to. How many of you like to watch the devil flee? I don't like that. You have to prepare yourself or you're unprepared. Right? Are you prepared to get sick, Jason? How about cancer? Donna Rita got cancer, right? I love Donna Rita. Who am I not to get cancer? Am I better than them? No, I don't think I am. Right? Are you prepared for that? How about are you prepared to die? Have you ever prepared for it yourself? You see, in war, you have to prepare your mind, your body for anything that comes your way, pre-knowing it, right? Pre-knowing what the enemy will do and what it will do. And be ready to stand against it. And if you get it, you know, we're the, we're the, we have to be great. Hey, if he slay me, I still have faith in him. I can't die. I'm not some crazy jihadist going to look to die. But if it comes from the hand of God, then it's a blessing, is it not? And if he slay me, I'll trust him. And for me to die is gain. And therefore, I'm prepared for it. So, hey, what? You can't kill me. I'm built for eternity. I'm a son of God. Right? He died for me, and I can die for him. What a great reward, huh? He loves me, I love him. What's the greatest act of love? Dying for somebody. I'm not saying we're going to be martyred, but I'm not saying you shouldn't prepare yourself. Because someday you might have to stand. We have very, very weak people in this country. I don't know how we'd ever go through the Depression in the Second World War. Very, very weak. All of us. The Scriptures implore us to be strong in faith and grace, right? Faith pleases God. Faith is humility. We have to believe in someone besides myself. It lays down my life and it gets grace. The two always work together. God works in me. I have to work out God in me. We need to go forward. We need to stand. And we need to get ready because it's coming. It's always coming. It's been coming. It is coming. It will come. I need to be ready spiritually, mentally, physically, every way, fully before God to his glory. Amen. Amen. We're out of time. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. Okay. Find out where you are. You know, you need testing. So, okay, I'll end with that. Find out where you are. Do you ever wonder where you are with God? Don't be afraid. Take the test. And if you fail everything and get one right, you're going to work for two right, right? You're going to go forward. Because God loves you. And God wants the best for you, doesn't he? And nobody else has that but God. He loves you. Amen? All right, God bless you. You're dismissed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, right now that you would work this in our life and then work it out because that's when we know it's real. We could see it in front of us. Help us to be warriors of faith, love, 
to this world around us, pleasing to you that we might get constant supply of your grace because we please you. And God, give us the humility to constantly be needing you. We don't like to need, but we're poor and needy, and we cannot fight this fight. But I thank God you won it before it even began. And God, help us to walk in the victory and praising the Savior who won us and won it all. Till you come in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Amen.